In 1918, the Boston Red Sox defeated the Chicago Cubs in the World Series. The victory marked the franchise's fifth championship since 1903. A year later, then Red Sox owner Harry Frazee sold future Hall of Famer Babe Ruth to the New York Yankees. Ruth became the game's greatest slugger, and the Red Sox infamously entered a championship drought. It's a home run for Bucky Bell. Behind the bag, it gets through Buckner. Bird hits it to deep left. That might send the Yankees to the World Series. When the 2004 season began, the Boston Red Sox had gone 86 years without raising a World Series banner. Right from the beginning, you know, we had a common goal. There wasn't one guy on our team that you said, man, he did it. It was just a collective group. We have a clubhouse that would go go to war for each other. Veritek and A-Rod going at it. Team effort from top to bottom. And there's not one person who deserves more credit than the other. And that's the great thing about it. That's what we tried to do every time we got knocked down. We just, we just got up and we kept moving forward. The Red Sox are headed back to the postseason for the second straight season. Ten years after reversing the curse, Members of the 2004 World Series champion Boston Red Sox reflect on that memorable season during part one of this special two-part edition of the Red Sox Report presented by CVS Pharmacy. Ortiz lifts it in the air to deep left field. Looking up, it is gone! Red Sox win 6-5! Walk-off home run for David Ortiz on a magical night at Fenway. In 2003, Red Sox Nation believed they had the team to finally break the curse of the Bambino. New additions Bill Miller, Kevin Millar, and David Ortiz combined with established all-stars Nomar Garcia Parra, Manny Ramirez, and Pedro Martinez to propel the Red Sox into the postseason. Bases loaded, 1-2 pitch. Strike three called in the Boston Red Sox have come from behind, trailing two games to none. After defeating the Oakland A's in the first round of the playoffs, the Sox faced off against their storied rivals, the New York Yankees. It would take seven games to crown an American League champion, and the Red Sox had the lead late in the deciding game. A flare in the center field. How does Walker won't get it? The base running of Matsui. He comes home. Nobody covers second. Tie game. The game remained tied into the 11th inning. Burn hits it to deep left. That might send the Yankees to the World Series. Burn a hero in game seven. There was nothing like walking out the field game seven. You know, first of all, we give up the lead. Second of all, we're in a battle with Mariano Rivera. And then it's like Wayfield comes in. It was just, I was just throwing balls down to my infielders. And I one hopped the dugout. And it was like coming down, balls in. First pitch, boom, devastating. I just remember though losing and, and going into that locker room and it without question being the, the most low, somber um, place I had ever been in. You know, you would have thought that somebody would have just come in or one of your teammates would have died. You know, it felt that heavy. Probably a lot tougher for me than the team uh, to put that loss behind me, but uh, didn't know how the fans were gonna react. But I think the group of guys that we had you know, 80% of us, it was the same team going in 2004. So you have to go through those miserable times in sports and the struggles to enjoy the good times. That off season, the Red Sox front office quickly turned its focus to 2004. And now it's uh, my pleasure to introduce the newest member of the Boston Red Sox, Kurt Schilling. I like the thought of 35 starts with no let up uh, emotionally. Uh, I like the thought of pitching in the, the biggest rivalry in sports in front of some incredible fans. In addition to trading for Kurt Schilling, the Sox also signed free agent closer Keith Folk. Red Sox Nation was again cautiously optimistic as spring training approached. When you looked at where they ended 2003 and what they did to make the team better in 2004, you, you knew that the potential was there. Um, then at that point though, you're still fighting history, you're talking about the curse, and you, you've got all this talent that's rolled through Boston year after year, decade after decade, and you think, when's it finally gonna break through? When's this finally gonna happen?
The 2004 Red Sox arrived in Fort Myers for spring training, eager to put the heartbreak of the previous season behind them. Game seven is over. We lost it. We didn't win. You know, that's, that's all of it. But, you know, again, uh, this game's built on failure, and, and you want to try and take the, the positives out of everything. We kind of took the loss as uh, kind of a motivating factor, knowing how far we had gone in 2003 and how close we had come. We just kind of looked at each other and said, you know, as far as we went that year, you know, let's see if we can go even farther in 2004. I mean, I think putting 2003 behind us was, was you know, was done by the time spring training started. Having turned the page, expectations for the 2004 team were high. I firmly believe that from top to bottom, this is going to be the best team I've ever been on. Definitely uh, excitement. I, the front office went and uh, traded for Keith Falk and, and was able to get Kurt Schilling. So um, it is, as disappointing as 2003 ended, uh, optimism, uh, we believe that uh, we were going to get at least back to the same spot we were. I kind of knew it was going to be a special team. You know, as soon as I got to spring training, you could tell, you know, how well the guys got along. You know, it was a great group of guys, a lot of veterans. It was just, you know, everything just made you feel real comfortable and, and at home. Right from the beginning, you know, we had a common goal. We knew what we wanted to, to accomplish. You know, everybody hopes to win a World Series in spring training, but, you know, there are certain teams where it's like, it's not going to happen, but that team is, you know, we knew that it was a great possibility. The 2004 season began in Baltimore without several key bats in the Red Sox lineup. Shortstop Nomar Garcia Parra and right fielder Trot Nixon both started the season on the disabled list. When you're a player, obviously, you want to be there with your teammates. You want to kind of be in the thick of things, be in the games, do what you could, do whatever you could do to help the team win, uh, whether it's being ready to come off the bench at some point or going out there and doing your job on the field and, uh, and starting the game off. But uh, uh, for me, it was very difficult. Despite the key injuries, the Sox started the season red hot, winning 15 of their first 21 games to lead the division by two and a half games. As the calendar turned to May, the winning ways wouldn't last. The Red Sox opened the month on a five-game losing streak, but bounced back, winning four in a row. Line to right field. That will get in for a hit. Gonzalez moving over to the wall. Has to get by him and down the line as Pokey Reese is still running. He can run it. He's got a chance to come all the way around. The throw to the plate is going to be not in time. Reese comes all the way around. The inconsistent play cost the Sox and by the end of the month, their lead in the division had vanished. I think uh, since we were kind of, you know, going back and forth, you know, we'd win and then we'd, we'd lose a lot and then we'd, we'd, we'd win, we'd, I think guys were trying too hard. June marked the return of Nomar Garcia Parra and Trot Nixon to the Red Sox lineup, but that did little to stop the slide. By the time the Sox traveled to New York to face the Yankees on June 29th, they trailed in the division by five and a half games, and things would only get worse for the struggling Sox. Flaherty hits it in the air to left field, back up, and it'll one-hop the wall, and the Yankees will win it in 13 innings. A crushing defeat tonight for the Red Sox, and the sweep by the New York Yankees. I think our struggles were, were more so, um, our pitching didn't settle in completely. We played well, you know, for quite a while, and then we weren't winning games. We're losing two to one, three to two, extra innings, this, that. You're going to have ups and downs, and uh, you know you want your ups to be longer and you want your downs to be shorter. But you know it's uh, it's character building. You know, and there's times where you know things don't go well, and <laughs> you're just not going to win every day. On July 23rd, the Red Sox once again faced off against their rivals in a three-game series against the Yankees at Fenway Park. The 2-2, hit in the air to left, 
Manny running after it. That ball is off the scoreboard. Sheffield will score the go ahead run. And the Yankees lead 8 to 7. And the recent struggles continue for Keith Falk. The loss dropped the Red Sox to a 52 and 44 record. They sat in second place, nine and a half games behind the Yankees. Game two of the series was scheduled to begin at 3.15 the next day. Overnight storms and rain in the forecast put the prospect of playing in doubt. It was a rainy day. Uh, you know, upstairs wanted to call the game. You know, you had just kind of a bunch of guys just like, what? We're not going to play. No, no, we're going to go play. So, you know, Veritek and whoever it was had the idea of going to Frank Cohn's office. Red Sox players had voiced their displeasure at the prospect of postponement and the decision was made to play the game. Well, I think that it was, it was a collective. It was, we knew what was in front of us. We knew what we had going. We knew what they had available to pitch. And we felt like it was an opportunity for us to, to start you know, taking some ground back from them when we wanted to play. Rain and dire field conditions nearly postponed the July 24th Red Sox-Yankees game. First and third, nobody out. After an uneventful first inning, the Yankees scored twice in the second and added another run in the third. That's up the middle. Bellhorn will step and throw. Double play, but the run scores, and that makes it 3-0. With two outs and no one on, Alex Rodriguez stepped up to the plate. So here you are, you got Bronson Royal, he's 112 pounds wet, six foot one, blonde hair, blue eyed, Cuban young man, throws about 87 to 90, maybe max. Hits Alex Rodriguez with a little breaking ball. Alex Rodriguez is drilled and to me, you know, Bronson was pitching inside and um, you know, you're supposed to pitch inside. I mean the, the, the scattering report on uh, on Alex is uh, He's got a hole inside. Didn't do any damage, but I think he was irritated that he thought maybe there was some intent there. So he, he said, throw that over the plate. And I was just kind of slowly walking towards him and the umpire to get another ball and, and just kind of smiling, you know. And, and, and he said, throw that over the plate again. And after he said it the second time, then Veritek basically said something. I couldn't hear exactly what he was saying, but it was along the lines of, you know, just go down to first base and shut your mouth. Something told me that Alex didn't know much about Veritek. So, uh, um, you back a dog into a corner, you better be ready to fight. He says something to Bronson Arroyo. Tech did exactly what he was supposed to do. He, he gets up and he gets in between the pitcher and, and the hitter. And, you know, then it obviously just all hell broke loose. And <laughs> Here we go. Veritek and A-Rod going at it. You know, just part of part of the game. You know, he felt he got hit. He was going after Bronson, and uh, and you know, yelling at Bronson, and I got in the middle of it. Simple. <laughs> Schilling is right in the middle of it. Now another fight off to the side. Millar is in it. Nixon is in it. We got there pretty quick, and so it was still pretty heated. And uh, you know, you get that many big guys dancing around. It's you know, you got to kind of head on the swivel. And I think that's what made our, our rivalries, you know, unique is that we fought a lot. And I think there was that respect because we were so opposite and different of each other. But yet there was that edge and it wasn't just the two cities, it was from the two teams. And that's basically what happened. Following the bench clearing brawl, the teams traded leads. The Yankees were ahead 10 to eight in the bottom of the ninth inning. Ruben Sierra makes it a two-run Yankee lead. A long, long, long day. A lot of runs being scored on both sides. And finally, they take the lead. They have, you know, they're studding the game, and everybody knows what a, what a phenomenal job he has done over and over. And now Mariano Rivera. Mariano Rivera entered to close out the game for the Yankees. 
A flare. It's a one-run game, and the tying run is on. After the Sox scored once, Bill Miller stepped up to bat representing the winning run. I remember Billy coming to the plate, and I think, you know, Billy had already had some success against Mariano, and uh, we just felt, I just felt like, like something good was going to happen. Now Miller's sitting on a 3-1 pitch. Driven in the air to deep right field. Back is Sheffield. The Red Sox win it. I never assume it's gone just because, you know, when you're 5'10", about 185, you don't, you don't assume that balls are gone at all, ever. So, uh, you know, you just uh, run your butt off, and once it's over the wall, then, then you can slow down. Yeah, I was, in the, I was in the locker room, and there was a bunch of us in there because the, the fight had really kind of stirred some stuff up. I know there was like five, six, seven guys kind of hanging out in almost in a manner that didn't happen a whole lot, and we're watching it on TV. And, you know, when Billy Miller hits that home run, uh, I, I can remember it was the first time during the regular season that guys were so happy and jumping around inside the locker room, not just on the field for the win, almost as if it was a playoff game. The win only got the Red Sox one game closer to the Yankees in the standings. But to the players in Boston's clubhouse, the victory meant much more. When Bill hit that home run and having Mo on the mound, um, you know, you finally see almost like this juggernaut finally has a, a chink in his armor, and he is beatable. It just seemed to give us a little bit of hope against uh, one of the greatest closers ever. It was remarkable because if there's one, I'd say, series or turning point or moment in a season that we kind of just all looked at each other and came together, it was that day. That was one of those games where you go back after the game that night and you think, it just feels different in the AL East and it feels like the Red Sox now have the upper hand. After winning two of three in a late July series against the Yankees, the Red Sox embarked on an 11-game road trip. The day before the non-waiver trade deadline, the Red Sox began a three-game series in Minnesota. It was a weird atmosphere in the clubhouse because uh, everyone didn't know where Nomar was going. Uh, they didn't know if he was going to get traded, if not traded, and Nomar being such an amazing Boston Red Sox player for so many years, it just it's weird. On July 31st, the Red Sox completed a four-team trade. All-star shortstop Nomar Garcia Parra was sent to the Chicago Cubs. In exchange, the Sox received Orlando Cabrera from the Expos and Doug Mankiewicz from the Twins. Anything can happen in baseball. You know, your uh, beloved son, um, best player uh, for the last decade, um, gets traded and as much as we were going to miss Nomar, we also knew that we were improving our range at shortstop. Line drive, down to get it, making the catch is Cabrera. I was really surprised uh, when I found out, and, but excited at the same time. I, I wanted to fly the same moment when I get in the plane and go to Minnesota. People really welcomed me uh, to the team, and um, you know, it was just so amazing. Uh, to just do that little little bit of the things that I know how to do uh, to help the team win. In a separate trade, the Red Sox solidified their bench by acquiring speedy outfielder Dave Roberts from the Los Angeles Dodgers. My honest thoughts, probably I was, uh, I was disappointed. I was uh, shocked. Uh, my wife at that point was eight months pregnant and to think about moving myself as well as her and the the baby was 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 tough but uh, you know when you step back a little bit from those initial emotions you're excited about the opportunity to play for the Boston Red Sox on August 1st the Red Sox remained eight and a half games behind the first place Yankees in the American League East but they were only a half game out of the wild card they had 60 games left to try to earn a postseason berth in our mindset you know we didn't think about all the hey, let's, let's try to win the East or let's try, we just need to get to the dance. 
And I think this team, whether it was going to be winning the East or making the wild card, we knew that that was our focus was making the playoffs. And, uh, you know, we didn't really think a whole lot past that. I don't think we were smart enough. Two weeks after a dramatic roster shakeup, the pieces finally came together for the 2004 Red Sox. Starting August 16th, the team went on a roll, winning 22 of its next 25 games. Damon reaching in first as Cabrera lines one towards the gap in left center field. Off the scoreboard, Damon is running. He'll be waved around. Here comes the winning run, and Damon is in. The Red Sox win. For me, it was uh, my first time, um, you know, being in a winning team. Uh, I, I have, you know, hit some walkout before uh, when I was in Montreal, but uh, never uh, anything with this uh, capacity, with this uh, magnitude. The streak gave the Red Sox a five-game lead in the wild card standings and brought them within two games of the Yankees for first place in the American League East. The Red Sox have swept the Detroit Tigers. On Friday, September 17th, the Sox traveled to New York with a chance to cut the Yankee lead in the division to a half game. Aaron will hit it to deep left field. That ball is gone. The home runs just keep coming for New York, their fourth home run of the day. This one is a two run shot and the Yankees go on top 11 to 1. New York's division lead was too large to overcome. With six games left to play, the Red Sox secured a postseason berth by clinching the wild card. Strike three call. The Red Sox are headed back to the postseason for the second straight season. This year hoping for a better fate. I think we were hoping to win the East. I mean, you don't set out to come in second ever but uh, we were satisfied that we were into the playoffs you have to be in the playoffs in order to win the series we knew we had the wild card and you know we just kind of kind of just rolled into it you know it's, it wasn't a whole lot of big celebration it's you know it was kind of expected <laughs> the Red Sox would face the Anaheim Angels in the American League Division Series the next step toward the World Series Coming up on part two of this special edition of the Red Sox Report. The Red Sox face a seemingly insurmountable deficit. Honestly, it's like how long can we survive before we get knocked out of this thing? An October legend is born. We knew then, if we didn't know before then, that, that this guy was going to become really one of the most clutch players in the game. And history is made. That city, that, th those fans, this team, this front office, this organization, you know, everybody was a part of it. And once that last out was made, it was like, we're champs. <laughs>